Chapter 4 Garden Fairies Mo worked hard for a while and had natural talent. Skilled at fixing TVs, he was soon in demand. People, especially stay-at-home housewives, would call regularly to get their TVs adjusted. He would drive the van, which was full of parts and tools, to a customer's house and pass a big magnetic wand over the screen, making adjustments or replacing vacuum tubes in the back of the set until the picture was clear. A couple of times, he brought Bradley along. The boy was proud to watch his father work magic on people's TVs. One of his customers was a lady named Trisha, who was all dolled up and strutting around in a red dress and high heels. Mo gave her a big kiss when he saw her, and she started grabbing him all over. He told Bradley not to say a word about it to Mom or ever mention the name Trisha. After that, Mo stopped taking Bradley with him and started coming home late from work, drunk. Natalie would have dinner ready, but it would get cold. She would keep the oven on, and when she heard him come into the driveway, she would reheat it. She tried hard to make the marriage work, but when Mo came staggering home one night after Bradley and Jeffrey were asleep, she yelled at him and purposely burned his dinner. The whole place smelled like burned toast. Mo went around opening the windows, calling her a bitch and telling her he was going to back out. He slammed the door behind him and didn't come home for the rest of the week. Months went by, and the couple managed to pay their rent and put food on the table. Most threatening to their lifestyle was their habit of spending Mo's money as fast as it came in. Paying bills became an uphill battle. When he got Natalie to drink with him, the two would end up yelling, which kept Bradley awake and made Jeffrey cry. Bradley began to spend more time outside where he could feel safe. Once, after coming home from kindergarten, Bradley was standing outside by the flower garden near the side of the cottage. It was a quiet neighborhood they had moved to, and he loved to explore. Natalie had been in a bad mood that morning, and he wasn't sure if it was safe to go inside. The breeze felt refreshing, and his nose caught the lovely scent of flowers in bloom. A friendly little bee buzzed by, as if to say hello. He felt relaxed and smiled at the bee, watching it closely as it landed on a flower. Twinkling lights appeared around the bee and moved up and down the leaves and stems. If he moved suddenly, the twinkling would vanish. So he stood very still, and the lights began to appear all over the plants and bushes. Golden, yellow, and white or green moving up and down. Then he heard whispers, and a soft voice called, Bradley, Bradley. He couldn't make out anything else, but he knew the lights in the bushes were reassuring him everything would be okay and telling him to be a good boy. It was a wonderful discovery, and he started going to the bushes every evening to watch and listen. Just thinking about the sparkling lights and voices in the plants made him happy. Mom kept asking him, Bradley, what are you smiling about? He had to share with someone so they could feel happy too. One day, Bradley decided to show his mom the lights but he worried it might be the wrong thing. It was always risky to show her something new. Half the time, she would get mean or tell him, Big boys don't do that. But she was always telling people about their astrology and things like Leo rising or retrograde Mercury. He decided to take the chance, so he told her. Did you really? You saw lights in the bushes talking to you? Uh-huh. Let me show you, Mom. He led her to the bushes and stood still. Nothing happened. He closed his eyes and thought, please, please come and show mom. But nothing happened. Well, I don't know. What am I supposed to see? Natalie wanted to believe him. She believed in such things. She'd love to think that her son had discovered something from the spirit world, something they could share together. Sorry, mom. I don't know where they are. We can try later. He was very afraid that she thought he was lying. Oh, damn it to hell, Bradley. I'm afraid you're going to turn out crazy like your grandmother. If I catch you talking to these bushes, I'm going to wash your mouth out with a bar of soap. Do you understand me? Natalie pulled away and went back into the cottage. It wasn't that she thought he was lying. She was just mad that he could have a psychic gift, when she didn't. After that, Bradley became more careful about visiting the bushes. He was afraid of what would happen if he got caught. He didn't know what it would be like to get his mouth washed out with soap. But he could imagine it would be horrible. Seeing the lights and hearing the whispers made the whole world seem better, however, rendering it worth the risk. Months went by, and Mom never did catch him. At school in the first grade, Bradley made two friends, Tommy, who had freckles and lived down the street, and Sherry, 
a pretty blonde who lived in a cottage two doors over. He couldn't help himself and told them about the lights in his bushes. They both wanted to see. Tommy and Sherry came over after school and stood very still by the bushes, just as Bradley had instructed. They stood still for as long as two young children could stand it. But just like with Mom, nothing happened. Bradley's hands were sweaty and closed in tight fists. He kept closing his eyes, then opening them, willing the lights to flick on. Nothing. Why was it that these lights only seemed to appear for him? Tommy started to fidget. I don't believe you. Let's wait, said Sherry. I want to see the fairies. She called them fairies, thought Bradley a spark of hope igniting in his chest. She knows. She believes. The door opened and out came Natalie in a bathrobe. She had heard Tommy complain. What in the hell is going on, Bradley? Get inside. You kids, where do you live? Where are your mothers? The kids froze in terror. Sherry started to cry and Tommy ran. I live over there. (laughs) Sherry said and pointed to a nearby cottage as Tommy disappeared around the corner. Bradley shrunk down and looked at his shoes, wishing he could become invisible at will, just like his fairies. Go home, girl, and don't come back here, Natalie ordered. Sherry nodded her head obediently, turned, and walked past the bushes, sobbing. Mister, get inside. Natalie followed Bradley in, slamming the door behind her. Sit right there and don't move or make a sound. Bradley heard his mother run the bathroom faucet. Then she came out with a washcloth wrapped around something shiny and white. Open your mouth, damn it. He was afraid to do it, but was more afraid of what would happen if he didn't. She grabbed his jaw between her thumb and fingers and squeezed, which opened his mouth farther and hurt so much his eyes teared up and he moaned. Hold still, you little shit. She worked the soap bar between his teeth, shook it back and forth as though she were scrubbing a dirty pot or a stain on the floor. That'll teach you to talk about goddamn fairies and things nobody else can see. She kept at it until he choked and started to panic. Only then did she stop and stand up, leaving the soap bar in his mouth. He doubled over, fell on his hands and knees and coughed it out, gasping for air. The room blurred and Natalie's voice was distant and muffled. Go rinse your mouth out and get in bed. And stay there. He ran to the bathroom and turned on the faucet, catching his breath, rinsing his mouth and spitting. The taste was horrible. It was stuck in his teeth and gums, and he couldn't get it all out. He thought of his friends and felt ashamed. He never wanted to go to school again. He cried for what felt like forever. After that, Bradley stayed away from the bushes and stopped believing in fairies. He sat in the corner of the classroom and pretended he didn't know Tommy or Sherry, and they stopped talking to him. Ever since Natalie had yelled at them, the three were afraid of each other. In the transcendent sixth density, Angelic Mentor observed the suffering that was being inflicted on her precious protege, born into a life of pain and poverty. Her metaphysical efforts to comfort him as a baby learning his first word, and again as a schoolboy who was sensitive to the beauty of nature, had not gone well with his unstable mother. Nobody deserved that abuse. Compelled by love and compassion, she began scanning the earth to find a safe and secure birth that would allow her to join him before it was too late. He deserved it. It was a warm summer morning in 1945, and 14-year-old Yoshio Yamashita looked up from the rice field to watch a strange weather pattern on the horizon to the west. There were dark clouds and flashes of lightning far away, from the next prefecture of Hiroshima, he guessed. He dabbed at his forehead, wiping off the sweat, and continued to work the soil. He had a long day ahead until it was time to get ready for night school. He had tried to enlist as a kamikaze pilot. His death would have brought honor and a nice financial gift to his family, as there wasn't much left of his father's wages after attending to his heavy sake intake. The military could not accept him because of his young age, however, leaving him with meager laborers' pay to help feed his four younger brothers and sister. Yoshio worked and studied until he could graduate and take a steady job with the utility company, and he made sure his siblings never went hungry and finished school. During that time, he met a girl from across Okayama Prefecture named Masako, who was impressed by the poor young man's ethic of hard work and sacrifice for his family. They married and worked seven days a week, dedicated to improving the family until Yoshio's younger siblings graduated and could move out to start their own families. The Yamashitas resided in an area that was naturally protected from catastrophes. The radiation fallout from the atomic blast 160 kilometers away did not bring death to their door, 
nor did the typhoons, earthquakes, or tsunamis that devastated other areas of Japan. The being from the higher dimension bound its consciousness to Masako's womb in the second month of her pregnancy. It had taken time to find a family that would provide a strong probability vortex for the success of her mission. While she waited, she embedded a desire to meet the man named Brad Rosedale in the United States. His name would not transcend the veil of forgetting, but the desire to find someone special, someone who needed her, would. And so would the deep longing to go to America. The Yamashitas were proud to give birth to a girl in 1964. They were inspired to name her Eri, which means blessed for a special reason.